scripture encourages us, encourages us to magnify the Lord and let us exalt his name together. And it is my honor and delight to exalt the name of the Lord together with you today. It's, it's always a pleasure, it's an honor to be in the house of God. There's nothing like it, absolutely nothing like it. And uh, while I'm saying that, it's also good to uh, get away every year. I try to, well, we make sure that we take a little break to celebrate our anniversary. And, and I just want to speak to all the couples who are here this morning. Um, prioritize your relationship. I, I was listening to the radio the other day and there was a protest of some sort going on somewhere. I just sort of jumped in in the middle of this, this um, little snippet, but it seems that what was happening is that a lot of women were complaining that their husbands weren't paying attention to them. And so there is a woman there, I don't know her name, but her husband's name is Norman. And, and she started to yell. I said, I've been married 30 years and my husband won't give me 30 seconds of his time. So Norman, I want you to hear me. I am here, see me. And she was really going on. And it was sad. It was very sad. After 30 years, this woman is on the street screaming at Norman to just give her a little attention. So husbands, I, I don't know if there are any husbands here named Norman. Okay, because this would not be a good day for you if your name is Norman. Prioritize your relationship and, and take time with your wife. And of course, if you're a wife, take time, make time for your husband. Um, I often think of the fact that we, we go through stages and phases in life, and I don't know what phase may come next. One thing I know is that for more than half my life, I have been with this young lady on the front row, and through all the phases and stages, she has been the constant. <laughs> and, and, and so please, please, um, I'm giving all of you instructions. If you come and tell me I won't be here the next couple of weeks because I'm going away on my honeymoon, no problem. Uh, take that time, make that time, prioritize the time. So that's sermon number one, but I'm glad to be home. Uh, well, I, 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 I am glad to be at Faith Sanctuary. Whether I'm glad to be back in Toronto, I was in a much nicer place <laughs> um, last week. But it is good to be in the house of God. And as, as we think of what is before us, I, I do want us uh, to remember that we start choir practice Friday night right after prayer meeting. So all of you who would like to be a part of our Legacy Choir, please make sure you come every Friday night between now and August. Things are coming into place very nicely and uh, we are looking forward to a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. I would like us to stand together and read a scripture, Psalm 46, and you can, if you don't have it, have your Bible with you or your phone, um, it'll be up on the screen. I'd like us to read this together. And we'll be reading the whole Psalm, Psalm 46. I was glad to look in last week at our youth service, and um, certainly it was wonderful to hear the word of the Lord as Sister Topi reminded us of how important it is that we worship our God. And, and that is good to see that everyone was engaged in worship and praise to God this morning. But don't forget that message. We just need to give ourselves in worship to God. Are you ready? Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, 
a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. Now, now I know we usually pass over that word, but there are three selahs in this chapter, and they're there for a reason. We are not exactly sure what it means, but it seems that it was just a musical rest or a pause of some sort. And so after making these statements, we have this sila. So we just take a little rest. Verse 4. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come. Behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. God bless you. Please be seated. When the Lord delivered Israel out of Egypt, it was preceded by the most catastrophic event in Egypt's history. All the plagues that God had sent to propel Pharaoh to let his people go didn't seem to work, but this last one did. Because on that particular night, all the firstborn in Egypt of man and beast died. And Pharaoh was quick to release the people of God, and this act as a death angel, as we refer to it, passed through Egypt and Israel was delivered that night. But even as they were on their way out of Egypt, God was speaking to Moses and he said, there's something that's happening here I want you to remember. Don't forget it. This is extremely important. All of the firstborn in Egypt has died. The scripture says there was not a household that didn't have someone uh, that had died. All the firstborn of Israel belongs to me. And so God gave him instructions in Exodus 13, very clear. I want the firstborn to be mine. So when a child was born, a firstborn child, a parent would go to the priest and they would take a price of redemption. They would, they would not kill that firstborn child, but they would pay a, a, a fee, so to speak. And that was to redeem, to pay for the life of their firstborn. If it was the firstborn of an animal, that animal would be sacrificed to God. The firstborn belongs to God. And he made that very clear. In fact, he took it a step beyond that. And he, uh, he took the tribe of Levi and he said, now this tribe is going to stand before me. Uh, I will bring the priests out of Levi. All of the workers in the tabernacle will come out of this tribe of Levi. And the Lord said to Moses, add up all the males in Levi. Those males are going to represent the firstborn in Israel. And so, so there are 20,000 something firstborn in Israel and almost an equivalent number of males in Levi. And basically God was saying, 
the firstborn belong to me and they're going to be in my service and they're going to do my work. And so the tribe of Levi was chosen for that uh, purpose and God was very, very serious about redeeming the firstborn and that the firstborn would be his for his work. And so uh, Levi was, was chosen. Levi had three sons, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And as Moses apportioned the duties of the, for the service of the tabernacle, the sons of Kohath, the Kohathites, were given the responsibility to carry the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars. The ark, of course, was covered by the veil of the temple. They carried that and all the utensils that were used in the sanctuary. And you read about that in Numbers chapter 3. I, I'm just sort of racing through this. You will need to just take the time to go through this on your own to, to get, uh, get all the information you would, you would like. These Kohathites literally carried the symbol of God's presence as Israel traveled through the wilderness to the promised land. Now, one of Kohath's grandsons was named Korah, and Korah had three friends from another tribe, the tribe of Reuben, Dathan, Abiram, and On. And, and so these friends were, were his, and you know, let me just say, it's interesting to see the people who people choose to be their friends. My wife's grandmother always had this phrase, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. And, and that is absolutely true. The people that you choose to be close to you say something about you. And so uh, Korah had these friends, and, and they decided that, you know what? Uh, we are not satisfied with what God has given us. We are not satisfied with the role he has called us to play. We want to be the priests. And so uh, Korah, along with these these Reubenites who had absolutely no calling or consecration to be a part of, of God's work and his ministry, they got 250 others and they came before Moses and they, they had their, their agenda set that they were somehow going to become priests. And so I, I'm just going to refer you to Numbers 16, and I'm going to read from verse 8 to verse 11. This is what Moses said in response to this group that came to see him to usurp the priesthood from Aaron. He said, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron? that you complain against him. So they, they came, there are a couple of phrases that, uh, or phrases repeated a couple of times in this passage that I think are very important. He said in, in, verse, uh, in, in verse nine, God has brought you near to himself. God has brought you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle. And, and in verse 10, he repeats it. He has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi. And so this, this really sparked something in my mind as I read this a, a little while ago. God had chosen Kohath and his descendants to come close, to serve him. In fact, this was of such... Uh, importance that God said, I'm not giving you an inheritance of land. All the other tribes got land that they would farm and work and build their houses, but God said, no, Levi, you belong to me. You are going to be near to me. 
you are going to be engaged and involved in my service. I want you that close. When they camped, they camped right by the tabernacle. They were right there. And, and God said to the tribes, look, designate cities. They were called cities of refuge. And along with being cities of refuge, these were the cities that were given to the Levites so that they would have a place to live once they came into the promised land. But the whole point was they were designated, dedicated to God, uh, coming from the firstborn being delivered in Israel uh, out of Egypt. All of these firstborn belonged to God and were called into his service. And so I would really like us to remember what an honor it is for us to serve God. What a high calling to have access to the house of God the things of God, to come close to God and to bear his presence. That, I, I know we don't think about it often, but Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3 and 16. He said, I, I want you to remember, actually, let me just uh, uh, flip to it here for a moment. He said, do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now God had moved beyond, in, in our case, moved beyond these, these uh, sons of Kohath bearing the presence of God, the symbol of his presence, to now us being temples of God. Paul said, don't you know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So when we are called into God's service, when we are doing whatever it is we do for him, it is because we have been called to a high place, an honored place, that we can be servants of the most high God. Every born-again believer becomes this temple of the Holy Spirit. And he's called us to serve him, called us to serve each other. He has called us to serve the world. We serve as Christ's ambassadors. Amen. And so we need to appreciate what God has done in us, what God has done for us, to call us to be his ambassadors, his servants, his people, doing his work in his house. So I would encourage you, whatever it is you are doing for God, do that with all your strength, all your might, all your energy, all your enthusiasm, put it into the service of God because we're in an honored place. We're in an honored place. So whether, whether God has spoken directly to you and given you a call into some form of ministry, whether you have been called by the leadership of the church to serve in a particular area, or whether you have just seen something in the house of God that needs to be done and you're doing it, Give everything into the service of God and just be happy. We don't need to be looking for anybody else's job. Moses said to Korah, what is Aaron that you're rising up against him? It's not Aaron. It is the calling of God that rested upon Aaron. Aaron is nothing. You don't try to take Aaron's position. You need the anointing of God on you. And whatever he has called you to do, you can do that and serve him, knowing as we do that his spirit dwells within us. And so let's give ourselves to the work of God, however and whatever he has called us to. God is the one who exalts and abases individuals. God is the one who puts people in place and takes them out of their place. None of us ever needs to think that whatever it is we're doing, wherever God has called us, um, we own it, and, and now it's ours, and, and we can never be moved. Uh, God, God can move us just as fast as lightning. I mean, he doesn't, <laughs> he's not beholden to any one of us. God calls, God places, God exalts, God abases. God makes vessels of honor. He makes vessels of dishonor. That's God's doing. And this is what we have to understand. His gifts and callings to us are according to his will, according to his pleasure. 
You read in Matthew 8 of a centurion that came to Jesus one day. And the centurion said, my servant is sick. Lord, would you please heal him? And Jesus said, no problem. I will come to your house and I'll heal your servant. The centurion said, no, you can't come to my house. I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. I'm a centurion. I have soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to this one, come, and he comes. And, and so, so you just speak the word. The centurion understood that Jesus had the power to call the shots. When he says, sickness, go, it goes. Uh, that's just the way it is. We need to understand that God is in control of our lives. He's in control of my life. He's in control of your life. Whatever he has given you to do, whatever he has given me to do, we need to be engaged in that and put every ounce of effort and energy into it and be faithful to the work that God has called us to do. Sila. If you're getting a little lazy, um, get out of bed. Uh, when God has given us a job to do, we need to do the job God has called us to do. And you might not even like the job he has given you to do. Uh, nowhere did it say that God was going to ask you, oh, uh, do you want to do this? Uh, is it okay if I ask you to help me and do this task? Um, God doesn't come to us and ask us for our opinion of what we think we should be doing. Or he gives us a job and we say, no. Nah, I don't want that job. I want that job. You know who you're talking to? <laughs> God says, this is what you're going to do. God says, this is where you're going to go. And uh, believe me, I'm preaching to myself as I'm preaching to you. I think, I think many of us uh, have a calling from God. And many of us, it's like, well, why does it have to be this and not that? But we have to come to the point of maturity that we understand when God calls, when God says jump, you ask how high while you're on the way up. Uh, we, we, we just follow as he leads. And everybody said? First Corinthians 12, it says, you know, sometimes the ear decides it wants to be the mouth. Well, just because... The ear says, I want to be the mouth. Does that mean it's not the ear? No, no. It's, we do what God has called us to do. We need to be faithful as God has called us. And so the end of Korah's story was tragic. He had led the rebellion against Aaron, and the earth just opened up and swallowed him and, and a number of his family members. The sons of Korah, however, were spared as numbers 26 and 11 tells us. And thankfully, their story ended up better than Korah's. So when we get to the book of Psalms, there are two series of Psalms written by or for, depending on the translation you read, by the sons of Korah. Psalm 42 through 49. Now, Psalm 43 doesn't say by the sons of Korah, but as you read 42, 43 is in exactly the same um, mode. It, it just seems like a, f a flow through and follow through. So Psalms 42 to 49, and then Psalms 84, 85, 87, and 88. So these, these Psalms <clears throat> were not attributed to the sons of Kohath, even though Kohath is the one that really was the leader of this family that Moses had called. These are called Psalms of the Sons of Korah. And it, it seems to me they were designated this way because the uh, uh, Korahites wanted to let everybody know, you know what, we didn't come from the best background and our father really acted very, in a very ungodly way and ended up dead. But we do want you to know that we have learned something from this. We, we have come a long way from that. And here we are today, and we have some things that we want to tell you, things we want to say to you. We are serving God as we have been called to serve him. We are happy to serve God the way uh, he has called us. And we're not rebelling. We're not fighting. We're, we're, we're 
done with all of that. Uh, we, we really are in a, in a place where we want to tell you some things that you need to hear about this God that we serve. And so, so when, we, when we look at it, we say, well, what is it that the Korahites wanted to tell us? If we go to Psalm 42, the start of this, this first series of psalms, just see if you recognize any of these verses that the sons of Korah wrote. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. Anybody ever heard that? Sons of Korah. Verse 11 in the same chapter. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. This is what the sons of Korah had to say. And we read it this morning as our, our main text, Psalm 46. This is what the testimony of the Korahites was. God is our refuge and strength. Man, that's a whole lot different than what Korah would have said. Now they have come to the point where they can testify, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. God heard this testimony from the sons of Korah and their faith in him. And he responded to them in verse 10. He said, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And then in verse 11, the sons of Korah jump back in. And they say, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. That's a whole different story than Korah and his 253 friends coming to say, God, you know, we're, we're not happy. We, we, we have to have this, that, and the other. Now his sons came to the point where they said, God, you are our refuge. You are our strength. You are our help in trouble. God responded to them and said, be still and know that I am God. I am your God. And they said, yes, Lord, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. See if you recognize these verses from Psalm 47. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is terrible. Also translated awesome. Our God is an awesome God. He is a great king over all the earth. Have you heard verse 6? Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. That's what the sons of Korah had to say. Psalm 48, verse 1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. We sing that to this day, the sons of Korah giving worship to God. Just happy to be serving him. Just happy to be worshiping him. Just glad that God has called them close to himself. We jump to the next series of Psalms in Psalm 84. It says, how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee. We sang this morning, my hallelujah belongs to you. I'm coming to your house, God, and I'm going to give you my praise. Whatever I can say, the fruit of my lips, my hallelujah belongs to you. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will still be praising thee. Jump down to verse 9. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face 
of thine anointed, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of, the, of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. You heard these verses before? Sons of Korah. It doesn't matter where you're coming from and what your background is. You can come to the place where you say, God, I am honored that you would have chosen me, that you called me, and whatever my family has done, whatever the past may have been, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you are my God. God is my refuge and strength. Amen. Amen. Psalm 85 tells us that God has forgiven the iniquity of his people and covered their sin. And even so, the sons of Korah pray, Lord, show us your mercy. Grant us your salvation. Psalm 88 is a long psalm that talks about uh, the agony and the despair and the anxiety that, that one of these sons was going through, but, but he's crying out to God in faith. We, we get to these points, but these writings of the sons of Korah help us. So we understand. We cannot engage ourselves in fighting against God, the will of God, the call of God, the plan of God, his worship. No, no. We thank God that he has called us into his house. Thank God that he has called us into his service. Thank God that he allows us to be in his presence, that we can lift holy hands in the presence of the Lord, that like the sons of Korah, the sons of Kohath, we can bear the presence of God in this world. We are a blessed people. We are a blessed people. And it is our privilege to serve, our privilege to serve. I'd like us to stand together for a few moments. I'd like us to lift our hands and our voices in worship and praise to God. Thank him for the privilege of service. It is a privilege to serve. Thank him that he has called us to himself. If someone can help me to sing the song, I'd love to sing this little chorus. If you can use anything, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord. Take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. I, I'd like us just to offer ourselves to God. If there's something that you know the Lord has called you to and you've just been a little lax, a little lazy, a little lackadaisical, to say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Let your spirit move through me. Here I am. Give yourself to God. If, if you have found something in the house of God, you found a place, a place where you can serve, give it everything you've got. It is a privilege to serve. A privilege to serve. Here I am, Lord. Uh, no. If you can use anything, you can use me. Can you help me? If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet, touch my heart, Lord, speak to me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Now let's sing that as we offer ourselves to the Lord. If you can use anything. If you can use anything.
together with him we know that God can do anything God has no restrictions there's nothing that holds him back of anything that he chooses to do but he chooses he desires he wills to use us to be laborers together with him it is a privilege to serve it is a privilege to serve and so we need to thank God for this I uh, we're going to transition into our communion service and uh, as we do that we are again looking at a situation where the Lord Jesus came not to be served but to serve in his mind it was a privilege to serve to serve us to give himself to us and for us and I'm going to ask those to come who will be assisting and serving communion today and as we as we turn our hearts and our minds away from ourself and our service I'd like us to remember and think of the fact that we have an example to follow the example of none other than our Lord Jesus Christ himself who came as an offering, a sacrifice for sin, who came to give himself, who came to live that life of perfection that we couldn't live, who came to give himself on our behalf. And it is an amazing thing that he came to serve. He came to be what we couldn't be, to do what we could never do. And so I'd like us to pray this morning as we turn our hearts toward our God. Think of what he has done for us. Think of the days that we, we sat in our homes, our apartments. It could have been on the road somewhere, just, just in a park walking and thinking of, of how desperately we need God. Some of us have looked at our lives and realized that we have nothing. There, there are those of us here who, who just came to that realization that without Christ, I am nothing. I have nothing of value. There is nothing that I have to offer to my self my family this world nothing without him but jesus came jesus came and he came to serve he came and took my place he lived the life i should have lived i i i really am thankful because if you look at your life and you think of what the dreams are that you had for yourself. And you say, well, how much of that have I actually accomplished? If you look at the things you could have done or should have done, and you weigh that against the reality of what you have done, say, I, I have a long, long way to go. But thank God, it's not up to us. <laughs> Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. And in the freedom, in the liberty of our salvation, we can live, we can work, we can love, we can uh, go forward in Jesus' name. Lord, we are so thankful to you that you have come to give us life and that more abundantly. You have come to show us that we, we really 
don't need to be concerned about perfection in and of ourselves because we had ruined that opportunity from infancy. But God, you came and made the way that we can exit this world of darkness and sin and enter into your kingdom of light, purity, holiness, into your presence. You paid the price for that to happen. You redeemed us. Even as the firstborn were redeemed that we spoke about today, you came to redeem every one of us with, without reservation, not just firstborn who had privileges and honored positions, but every one of us has been redeemed, not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We use the feeble words that we have available to us as human beings to say thank you. But beyond these words, Lord, I pray that as you look into our hearts, you will see that truly from our hearts to the depth of our soul, we are thankful and we give you honor and glory, worship and praise. Lord, we are coming at this time to share together in the emblems of your broken body and your shed blood. Your body that was broken for us, the stripes that you bore for the healing of the nations being wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Your broken body that speaks to the chastisement of our peace that was laid upon you and those stripes you took for the healing of the nations. We thank you for your blood that was shed, the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood that has not lost its power. When we drink of this cup, it reminds us of your blood. And the life is in the blood. Your life was in your blood. And as we drink this cup, we remember your life that life which we now take into us so that it is Christ in us that we truly can be tr new creatures in you, serving you, worshiping you, having the mind of Christ active in us, the will of God being enacted in our lives. And so Lord, although we weren't there on that day when you broke the bread and gave the cup to your disciples, you instructed them that as you did it with them, they should continue this practice in remembrance of you. And so we come gladly today to partake of this meal, this feast, this celebration. And although it was such an awful situation that you faced, we are able to celebrate it because of what you did for us. And so bless these emblems, we pray, of your body and your blood. And help us, Lord God, to worship you, to thank you, to be grateful for all you have done, and to receive you into ourselves, that you can give us health and strength and spiritual stamina to walk the path we need to walk, to live the life we need to live, to allow you to continue to rule and reign in our hearts. For these blessings, we give you thanks. We give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you have repented of your sins, been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, we know that that's the situation the apostles were in and Jesus served them, his body and his blood. You are free to come, not because you're perfect, and not because you deserve to, but because Jesus has opened the door to us. I don't know if I will get the key right here, but there's a, a song that says, Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me 
be thy all 